All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for coming, particularly during a summer uh, session. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, a very good friend and close collaborator and a prolific scientist, Anna Carpenter, who uh, has really done a lot of groundbreaking work in the world of informatics, not only in her own research, but also being a community leader. And we're fortunate to be, have a grant with her to really uh, brainstorm solutions for the imaging sciences uh, using software, including ImageJ work and Soul Profiler. So, we were lucky that Anne's on vacation all summer, and yet it's a vacation where she was willing to come by and visit us while she was in town for something else. So we're delighted that Anne was willing to give up some vacation time to see us here. And uh, so she'll be talking about her work and drug discovery, which I think is really exciting, with soul painting. And uh, uh, thanks, Anne, for coming, and the floor is yours. Yep, it's, it's my pleasure to be here, um, really, especially at a place where microscopy is such a strength, um, to, to be able to share the work that's been going on in my lab, with Carpenter Singh Lab, together with Shantanu Singh. And you'll hear little bits and pieces about um, research going on in a lot of different laboratories through this talk. So I, I, I like to be a representative of many different kinds of groups doing many different kinds of things. And everything I'll talk today about is gonna be um, not confidential, so you're welcome to, um, I have, in fact, the PDF of the slides are there, um, so you, or you can take pictures or screenshots or whatever you need to um, keep track of things. So let's get started. Um, my, my research is based on the premise that images have a ton of information in them. And um, this information is inherently single cell resolution. We can take images of all kinds of things, cultured cells growing in a dish, but also tissue samples and whole organisms and um, very complex co-cultures and so on. So really a, a wide variety of biological systems are compatible with imaging. And then most importantly to this talk, it's a quantitative um, modality, so we can quantify all kinds of features from these images and learn all kinds of great things. And it's also multiplex. There's, um, you can, if you're gonna label for something, why not label for a few other things at the same time and measure all, all kinds of things in your, in your images. So we're, we're fascinated by images as a data source. And my lab is entirely computational now. It's trained as a cell biologist, but our lab is all machine learning experts now. And our goal is to figure out how best to leverage this information for important biological purposes. And especially as you'll see a lot of drug discovery applications that I'll talk about today. So most of the experiments that we are working on tend to be large scale imaging experiments where we have lots of samples that have been imaged. And those can be usually cells or organisms put into multiple multi-well plates, little test tubes all lined up in a row where the bottom is transparent so that you can do microscopy through the bottom of the plate and image the cells. There's tons of robotic microscopes available these days that collect images around the clock and then we can extract features of interest and we'll talk more, a little bit more about that. And those include things like the size and shape and intensity and the texture of, of the um, samples. And then once you've extracted some numerical representation of the image, then you can do data exploration and machine learning. And I should say, I'm really happy to pause and answer questions as we go. It's a lot more fun that way, so please, uh, please interrupt me or shout out if there's uh, something online at the Zoom, on the Zoom. So my lab is, um, one of our most famous products is Cell Profiler. That's uh, the cell image analysis software that I started writing as a postdoc and um, now used by thousands of biologists around the world, especially for these high throughput kinds of experiments where you need to put together a bunch of modules to accomplish a particular thing. And um, this is something we've worked on for quite a while. Uh, now Beth Simony is leading a, a project that uses, called Piximi. It's not quite ready for, uh, for biologist use yet, but it's going to use deep learning to, to do a better job, a more accurate job of identifying objects and images and then um, uh, machine learning classification and all kinds of other features to be able to, to extract what people know, phenotypes that you know you wanna look for in images. We've been able to continue this work, thankfully, under this grant that Kevin mentioned. The COBA is the Center for Open Bioimage Analysis, so we're really grateful for the NIH support for these open source tools, which are otherwise a little hard to keep going and keep healthy, um, and that's kept these projects plus ImageJ in, in really great shape over the past few years. 
years. And uh, one of the perhaps most important take home for those of you who are producing images regularly is that you should uh, memorize image.sc. There's an online forum there where there's thousands of people asking questions about how to carry out image analysis, what software should I use for my project, and so on, and a really helpful community that can get you unstuck on, on image analysis problems, so I highly recommend that. Uh, so my lab, historically, over the past 15 years, we've spent uh, an awful lot of time helping biologists to um, screen all kinds of random things. And I'm just going to show a few slides of some different examples of things that people like to measure in images, where they have in mind a particular phenotype, they want to quantify it, they might be testing lots of samples, and that can include things from the, the whole organism, how, how is this GFP reporter distributed throughout the body of the worm, it can be very high resolution, like this DNA damage, that's a single nucleus with little speckles induced by, by radiation, and so on. Just lots of different things, we're measuring the, the shape of things, the intensity of things, we're counting things, um, we're looking at co-localization patterns, uh, we can look in tissue samples, uh, we can look at uh, co-cultures, in this case of tuberculosis, bacteria that's infecting human cells, and so on. And we can take it into multi-dimensions, so we can measure uh, different features of time-lapse images and three-dimensional images as well. And so I'm not going to go into any of those individual projects. Um, just want to say that this kind of thing can really have an impact on, on patients. Some of the projects we've worked on have um, gotten to a successful clinical trial. On the left is a project um, with John Crispino here at Northwestern University nearby, and he uh, identified uh, uh, compounds that were already in clinical use for other um, indications and found that they might be helpful for myeloid fibrosis. And, and that's because they cause the uh, nuclei to uh, become polyploid, the cells to become polyploid, and, um, and therefore slow down and stop proliferating and stop being cancerous. Um, and so that was a really exciting project that we worked on. The second project shown here is one we had absolutely nothing to do with it, but people downloaded our software and used it to um, to carry out a personalized medicine trial, and I'll just briefly explain it because it's really cool, where they take um, tumors from a patient who's already very, um, has progressed very far and existing medications have not been working for them. So they take the tumor out, they plate the cells into a multi-well plate, and then treat each individual sample of the cells with different chemicals that are already known to, uh, they're already approved cancer drugs. So potential candidate drugs that this patient might get, they treat all the different samples and then they look and see which, one, which ones the tumor is actually responding most to. And, um, and then using that to guide the treatment that the patient gets. And that was uh, also a successful trial um, that, that really made a difference, so we were very excited about it. So that's all I want to talk about measuring known phenotypes. So I want to talk about today a revolution in how images are being used. The examples that I showed so far, the biologists came to us and said, I'm studying this disorder or this biological process and I really want to count up this or I really want to measure that. And they might not know the name of the feature that they want to, that they want to measure, but they can at least describe what it is that they want to quantify in the images. And that is that field of, of developing um, image analysis tools to be able to do that kind of screening. It's called image-based screening or high content screening because it's high information content. And that work is actually, as of a year ago, has been taken over by an alum of my group, that's Beth Simony. Um, so if you have any specific image analysis related questions, um, her lab is the one that's carrying on the work with Cell Profiler and, um, and, and just generally how do, we, how do we extract phenotypes that we know we want to measure. The Carpenter Singh Lab is now working primarily on image-based profiling, and you may have no clue what that is, so the rest of the talk I'll explain what it is and also give a lot of different examples, concrete examples of how it can be used. So image-based profiling is the general term. We use the cell painting assay um, specifically most often, and the basic concept is that we say we don't know what we want to get out of these images. We have images. They have a lot of information in them. Let's extract the features and then um, use those, those profiles, those features, to look at similarities and differences of samples. And the question is, why might you want to do that? So I'll, I'll give you some, some examples here. So the basic concept is very similar to what happens when you look at a human face and you think, oh, I think that person might have a certain, a certain disorder. So I think that child might have Down syndrome because I see certain features. Now, you can measure certain features. You can say, oh, I think it has something to do with the distance between the eyes or other facial features. Um, or you can train machine learning algorithms to take human faces and, and be able to predict, as you can see the confidence levels here, to be able to predict a, a disorder from, from a human face. Now, uh, some, of us, some, some of us untrained 
people can, can recognize certain disorders, but you certainly need an MD um, to, to discern other disorders, a specialist. You might also have to zoom in. You might have to look more closely at the um, cells or tissue samples in order to diagnose a disorder. This is the basic concept that image-based profiling is based on, but instead of looking at faces or, um, or tissue samples, we typically look at cells and culture, and that's because we can manipulate them, and we can test drugs on them, and we can do all kinds of um, experimental procedures on them. So in image-based profiling, um, and it, this is the most important slide to understand for the whole rest of the talk, image-based profiling, we use these, um, we prepare a bunch of samples that we care about, and we'll, we'll show examples, but we uh, stain them with the cell painting assay, and then we extract lots of features, and we end up with these data matrices where we have lots of features for lots of cells. And this is just a teensy, teensy snapshot, because often we'll have hundreds of thousands of perturbations. We usually have thousands of features, and we usually have many thousands of, of cells. So we get these data matrices, and this is real data, a, a teeny bit of real data. So you can see different samples look different from each other. So visually, you look at the cells, and a cell biologist can say, oh, these cells are a little, these have more mitotic cells, or they um, have funny crinkly edges that I've never seen before. You know, you can describe them verbally, but you can also describe them in these quantitative feature extracted ways. And so once we have those profiles, it's just like transcriptional profiling. We can look at um, which samples are like each other, which samples are different from each other, and that allows us to link drugs to genes to, to disease states. So are there any questions uh, uh, for what I've described so far? Ah, so what are the dyes? I think, I think this is one of those planted questions, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, I think I talked about that next. Yes, um, so the dyes, in this case, we've chosen, um, again, coming from my cell biology background, everybody's favorite inexpensive dyes are, is basically what the cell painting assay is. We picked the, the cheapest, most scalable kinds of things so that we could do, that a, a pharma company can do this assay on a million compounds, and it's not that expensive. Um, so that includes a stain for the DNA, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the, the cytoplasmic RNA as well as nucleoli, and then the wheat germaglutinin is staining the, uh, as you can see in the left there, and also phylloidin, and then mitotracker for the mitochondria. That's the only one that's put on before the cells are, while the cells are still alive, um, but then everything else is it's after it's fixed. And um, so it's just like a bunch of organelles of the cell is what we stain for. Because you might ask, um, you know, this sounds, maybe still sounds pretty abstract and spacey, like if you don't know what you're looking for, what are you staining for? And the answer is let's stain a broad variety of things in the cell that might be responsive to perturbation. That's, that, that's, those were the criteria that we used for making the assay. The, the edge of the cell? Yeah, so the question is whether we stain the edge of the cell, and not really, I forget, um, we often switch up which dye we use to find the border of the cell. It's usually the, R the cytoplasmic RNA is usually the nicest because it's really smooth out towards the edge of the cell. Um, but in theory, you can probably also use the, the bottom left um, actin-golgi plasma membrane channel as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So that's the basic idea. We're extracting a bunch of features. What on earth are we doing with all these features? So I'll start with a, a, some of the um, easier to understand kinds of examples. How might this information speed up the drug discovery process? Um, the, this is a rough outline of the process. Usually there's some kind of assay, a, a cell-based assay anyway. There's also biochemical target-based drug discovery where you already know the protein you want to um, attack and then that's a totally biochemical approach. So here's for cell-based assays. We develop some kind of assay, we screen a small molecule library, and otherwise we test a bunch of compounds. We find hits, which are promising compounds, and we optimize them to turn them into leads, and then we do preclinical and then clinical trials. Okay, so making new assays, can we identify signatures of a disease using images, and then screen drugs to reverse the signature. And this is an example of how this looks. It's a collaboration with Miko Taipale at the University of Toronto. And uh, the, the graduate student Jessica Lacoste in the lab worked on tagging a lot of different human genes, and she tagged both the wild type version, the referen which we'll call the reference version, as well as a version that is mutated in particular human disorders. So probably most of you and I cannot tell that this child has Noonan syndrome from looking at their face. We're looking at the cells, and the question is, is there any difference in the localization of this LZTR1 protein in the presence or absence of this mutation. And in this case, you can see a difference. So there's a, roughly three cells are shown on the left and then one cell on the right. Um, you can see that the um, protein changes localization from kind of these 
blobby vesicle looking structures to like little dots um, on the right and, and also some more diffuse staining. And so she noticed many of these by eye and then we helped her to quantify a lot more of them by, by, um, by computational methods. And once you've found, it doesn't happen all the time that proteins are mislocalized in the case of a mutation for a human disorder, but it happens some fraction of the time. And when that happens, we can then take the cells that are in the unhealthy um, mutated disease state and see are there any drugs that can rescue or reverse this phenotype and make the cells look happy again. And uh, we can also test genetic perturbations to figure out if there's a potential target that's involved, uh, what, what are the mechanisms of this disorder. And so she started with 3,000 disease variants as well as their reference counterparts, identified changes in protein localization as well as um, cell morphology. So I'm, we had a couple other channels in this experiment that are not shown here, but we could look for changes in the nucleus at, at the same time as we were looking for changes in the protein's actual localization. In the end, we found a few hundred disease phenotypes. So as a fraction, 200 as a fraction of 3,500 is not a huge proportion. However, in terms of we now have 200 really great routes, really great methodologies to now try to find drugs for these patients that are many of these are many rare disorders that are not otherwise studied. Um, it's a really large absolute number. Um, so here at the Broad, even though we do a lot of high throughput work, um, we're NIH funded. Um, and so we just don't have money sitting around to do um, 200 uh, drug screens. We can do one or two or maybe four. Um, so we, we have to figure out how to solve that bottleneck. We especially have to solve that bottleneck because we are about to start testing 80,000 variants associated with different disorders. And we'll be finding, even again, even if the fraction is small, we'll be finding tons of disease phenotypes. Um, so in each of these cases, a pharma company could take this as an assay and, and screen their whole drug library and find drugs that, that seem to, to repair the problem that the cells have. Um, so I'll just briefly say, um, to get over this bottleneck of, okay, now what do we do? How are we gonna do 200 drug screens at once? There's a pooled optical profiling, um, is a method developed by Paul Blaney at MIT, and we've been collaborating with him to adapt it so that we can take all 200 um, mutated for versions of a protein, as well as the reference counterparts, put them all in a single well together and add one compound to that well and say, does this compound treat, um, does it reverse any of the disease phenotypes in a dish? And we use barcoding to figure out which cell has which um, version of the protein and, and, and which gene is, is uh, referenced there so that uh, we can do a drug screen in a much more efficient way. So that, that work is just getting underway. And um, I, I hope to have uh, good news so that um, many of these patients with these rare disorders um, that are not being studied otherwise might have some potential routes for treatment. Okay, to take another example of finding a disease phenotype, we can look at patient samples. So in this collaboration, it's been ongoing for um, since 2007, so a very long standing work with Bruce Cohen at McLean Hospital. It's everybody's side project, so it hasn't been on the, on the front burner for most of us over the years. But gradually over time, they've been collecting a lot of patient samples. And these are skin cells from patients that either experience psychosis, and that would include schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or schizoaffective disorder. And, and then matched controls that are healthy. And in this experiment, we um, searched, we, we used uh, an assay like the cell painting. We did image-based profiling to look at all the different features of the cells. And in that case, it turned out to not require fancy machine learning. It, it all came down to one uh, feature was pretty well predictive of, of psychosis. And you can see it's described here, dispersed mitochondria is, is what we call it. And what that means is whether the cells are far away from the nucleus or whether they're close, close to the nucleus. And as you can see, it's not, it's not a diagnostic. It's not completely separating between control and um, patients with psychosis. However, uh, it's enough to convince us um, um, together with um, other evidence that I'll, I'll skip over for now, brain opt autopsies of patients, for example, enough to convince us that, that this is a real distinction in the, in the um, probably metabolism of these cells. And we have just only a teensy bit of data. I probably shouldn't even show it because it's so preliminary, but a little bit of data from taking those um, skin cells and, and converting them into astrocytes and seeing roughly the same thing. And so we've identified this morphological change. What can we do now? We can test drugs to reverse the unhealthy morphology again. And um, this is nice, I should say, for, for a lot of mental conditions, um, taking patient samples is a better approach because there are 
far fewer genetic underpinnings that, that are known for a lot of these different disorders. But we are curious, at least for, for um, schizophrenia, it's the case that we do have lists of genes that are underlying um, risk for, these, uh, for the condition. And so we should be able to, to um, modify those genes in vitro and see whether we see impacts on these same kinds of morphology. In the meantime, we want to um, skip ahead to like, okay, how, how can we turn this into a way to find, find new drugs for, the, um, for these patients? And uh, again, we could physically do a drug screen. We could take the fibroblasts that are in the unhealthy um, condensed state and try to make them be in the more dispersed state by adding a compound. Um, but again, we don't have infinite resources, so we thought we would take a computational approach. Since it's just this one phenotype, mitochondrial dispersion, we asked, do we have any data sets where we ever collected images where the mito mitochondria were stained using MitoTracker? And we found some, some um, this is a pretty small set of compounds, but we started here where we looked up all the compounds that had some amount of mitochondrial dispersion. So I'm not showing any of the data that's in the middle of the plot, around zero. I'm only showing the statistically significant compounds that are um, very low or very high in mitochondrial dispersion. And the first thing we noticed is that there are a bunch of compounds that can disperse the, phen the mitochondria. However, most of them are nasty, toxic cancer drugs that you certainly would not want to give to a patient in a, with a chronic condition. So that caused us to add the y-axis here, which is the overall morphological change of the cells. So we want the mitochondria to be dispersed, but we also want the rest of the cell to look reasonably normal. And so that uh, caused us to look for compounds that are more in this area of the plot. Um, look, and our collaborator was quite excited because these, um, the hormone receptors um, are known to, sorry, I should say hormone fluctuations are known to impact the symptoms that these patients have. And so to him, this is a really nice biological validation that we're looking in the right place. And um, we're now excited to scale this up to larger compound libraries where we have these images available so that we can um, take those compounds and then test a few hundred compounds instead of tens of thousands of compounds um, in, a, in a much less expensive drug screen. Any questions so far on these examples where we're, where we're trying to identify a disease-related phenotype that's easily screenable in a dish? Oop, there's a question. <laughs> Thanks for making cell Royal open source. You're welcome. Um, and making data sets publicly available. Yes, the data set will definitely be publicly available. It's not yet. Um, the, that data is controlled by the Taipali lab, but they are, promised me that they are getting really close to writing up the draft of this paper, and so I would imagine by the end of the year that data should be public. Thanks for asking. That is so cute. <laughs> All right. Um, so we went through two examples of how you can identify a disease phenotype using image-based profiling and using this kind of unbiased, let's just look at the images and see what the data is telling us is different between the disease state and the healthy state. So we looked at localization, we looked at, um, at using patient cell lines, uh, sorry, we looked at variants that are associated with disease, we looked at patient cell lines. Another way you can do this, which I won't go into detail, is based on knocking down genes. So Recursion is a company that originally um, launched out of University of Utah where they <clears throat> knocked down genes that were known to cause human disorders and identified phenotypes that are associated with the knockdown. And then, again, pursuing those for, for drug screening. And they have four drugs going into clinical trials. So that definitely this, this overall strategy is, is working for them. All right, so let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Can we make better diagnostics that help us know whether a patient should get a particular drug? So in this set of examples, I, I'm not going to go into detail for each of them, but what, what can image-based profiling do? Well, we can identify disease phenotypes, um, sometimes even in the absence of molecular biomarkers. So in the examples I showed so far, um, I mean, let's, let's just say historically. Historically, the approach is, well, I'm interested in this disease. I have to figure out what proteins do things in this disorder, in this disorder and then I have to la label them with antibodies and see where they move or see what's going on with them, how, what the levels are over time. Here, we're trying to take an approach that's just completely label-free. So if we take cells that are of different white blood cell types, can we tell the difference between them using microscopy um, without any stains present at all. So the collaborators we worked with here, they normally use four different antibodies, fluorescently labeled antibodies, and they usually use flow cytometry. But instead here, we used imaging flow cytometry where um, that was completely label-free. And the idea is just um, image the cells 
with, um, without any labels and ask the computer to learn the difference between the four, um, the different white blood cell types that are, that are listed here. And it turns out, um, even though for decades people have been using these antibodies to label the different um, white blood cell types, it turns out the computer can do a very fine job with just the bright field and, and dark field images, which is quite a surprise to us. We then got greedy and said, well, um, the, the biologists were telling us that normally they can't tell the difference between B and T cells by eye, but the computer was able to not do a great job. You can see the accuracy, F1 score accuracy there is 78%, um, but it's better than random to be able to distinguish those um, cell types that are otherwise visually indistinguishable. So we got pretty excited about this kind of a thing and, and basically did the same thing with leukemia, where normally they would use lots of antibodies to figure out is this, um, you know, all the different CV markers that people use to, to um, quantify whether a cell is in a particular state, such as leukemia. And again, the bright field image um, was able to, had sufficient information in it to be able to tell us whether the cell was leukemic or not. This kind of thing, I, I hope, is um, just really exciting because what that means is, you know, we stare maybe at fluorescent images all day long and we see what we see, but it makes you wonder, like, how much more information is in there that we're not actually observing with our eyes and, um, and how can we leverage that? A third example is for um, blood bags that are stored for blood banks. And normally, um, you donate blood. It sits in the, in the refrigerator for a certain period of time, and then gets thrown out because the blood has degraded to a point where it's not as helpful to the patient. And so in order to study that process of degradation and try to figure out how to make blood last longer and at, at more tolerable temperatures, um, these researchers were um, wanting to upgrade the, um, the what, what is normally a um, um, morphology <coughs> based um, scoring system. So this is how experts in the field score a bag of blood. They count up how many cells fall into these seven different categories, and they judge it by eye. And if you know anything about machine learning, you know that um, science has progressed to the point where, gosh, a computer should be able to do that. There's no reason for experts to be staring at these all day long. And, and it's true. Um, the computer did a pretty decent job of it. We're a little disappointed that it was only 76% accuracy. You can see most of the mistakes. This is a confusion matrix where the prediction is on, on one axis and the expert's official correct answer is on the Y. And um, most of the mistakes are on the diagonal, which is what you would expect for a continuous process. Um, and so, you know, not, not too bad. And we felt even better when we saw one expert versus another expert, and it was also um, not 100%. Um, so, so we felt pretty good. OK, the computer can basically match a, a human now. But then we started to wonder, well, it is a continuous process. Are we sure we want to divide? This is just sort of a historical thing that humans could do, is divide it into seven categories. But it's continuous, so maybe we should take a different approach. So we used a, a, a deep learning strategy um, known as uh, self-supervised learning or, um, to, to sort of invent a new score. And what we did is we trained the deep learning model to predict how old is this bag of blood. As a totally useless, dumb classifier, no, nobody needs a classifier to tell them how old a bag of blood is um, because bags of blood have labels that tell you how old it is, right? So um, we don't need the classifier, but what we need is the computer to learn the features that are important for predicting um, the age of the blood. And once it's done that, we can um, take off the deep learning layer that does the classification and just look at the, the features and use them in order to devise this linear um, pattern of old blood versus new blood. And using that more continuous type of scoring, um, we, we devise the self-learned morphology index, and that correlates very nicely with the um, biochemical score of how well the blood performed, in, in essence, or um, how, 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 bad, it wouldn't, how bad of a state is the blood in. And that worked much better than using this seven category expert um, morphology index. So pretty excited about the potential, again, for the computer to see things that we can't see and also um, the, its ability to put things in a smooth, continuous order rather than um, needing to, to divide it. You know, our little brains can only do so much and, and we, we tend to categorize things. It makes it easier for, for, for training a system but, um, but is really missing out on a lot. Any questions about those kinds of label-free and um, other kinds of methods? Yeah. Yeah, the question was whether we ever um, use uh, sort of the label-free bright field channels together with cell painting. And definitely not in those projects, but um, in the very big jump cell painting data set that we're making right now, a number of the partners were able to collect bright field alongside the fluorescent um, stains. And that raises a really good point, which is, 
um, it's becoming, um, you may have seen several papers over the past few years where if you have matched bright field and fluorescent images, you can often train a machine learning um, predictor uh, um, model to predict what the fluorescence looks like just given the, the bright field image. And that works to a surprise, you know, again, to a surprising degree. We should probably stop being surprised, but it works nicely sometimes um, for some stains to be able to do that prediction. And so um, we do wonder, like, to what degree do we need all the cell painting stains, or could we predict some of them from the bright field alone? So for now, we're collecting them all, and, um, and it'll help to answer those questions a little more quantitatively. Yeah. So <coughs> Oh, that's it. that's it's interesting. Really, you know, it's, it's a really expensive assay. It's, you know, if you don't have good insurance, it costs like seven grand. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, um, there's a breast cancer oncotyping that is a 22 different markers and really expensive. Um, and you know, could that potentially could you get away with um, an image-based approach there? Possibly. My guess is it's expensive because of the R and D that went into it. So that that cost is not going to go away. But to the extent that it's um, the cost of the actual antibodies and reagents, um, certainly that, that would be something, something that could be checked. Or it doesn't even, I mean, um, having an assay be label free is really great if you want to convert it into a super cheap microscope and like cell phone camera for developing countries or something like that. Like that, that's where going label free is really valuable. Um, for the case of, you know, uh, for oncology, um, you know, people don't mind using fluorescence if, if, that's, if it gets the job done. So you could also imagine, well, maybe we don't need the 22 markers, maybe we could get by with three or four if we had the image, look, the morphology data together with just the amount of how much of it, each protein is there. So that's, that would be something to try, I would think. Any other questions? All right, so next example is a, a bit more basic biology. Can we, can we identify gene and allele functions by grouping similar genes and alleles with each other. So here we're gonna take a profile, a query gene that has a certain profile. We've either knocked it down or we've overexpressed the gene and we've produced this image-based impact. And we wanna see, have we ever seen that pattern before in any data that we have um, collected before? So our first foray in this, um, this direction from five years ago is where we just overexpressed a, a few hundred genes and um, roughly half of them gave a distinctive phenotype. This is in the actual cell painting assay now. And uh, we did the image analysis, we clustered the profiles, and um, to me this like brought tears to my eyes because it's such a beautiful, um, you know, in, in one little image-based experiment um, on, you know, just a few plates, uh, microplates, uh, we were able to identify a lot of the genetic pathways um, that are involved here. A lot of these were cancer-related um, um, genes. And we found, for example, the hippo pathway, um, we saw isoforms of the same gene were typically nearby each other. We saw members of the same pathway were nearby each other. We saw that um, genes that have opposite regulatory effects often had opposite image-based profiles, which was a little unexpected. We were, we were excited to see that that was the case. And so this gave us the confidence that um, we should scale this up to the whole genome. Um, just this year, we've produced 13,000 genes, and that's um, gonna be made public on November 1st this year. And um, so that data is coming soon. We'll have a much, much bigger map. Um, but we also went in other directions. Aside from scanning the whole genome, I wonder what it looks like to look at different variants of, hu of, of human genes. And so in a, in a different experiment, we took a few, again, a few hundred, maybe 500 uh, alleles that were associated with lung cancer. I'm just showing one gene here just for, to explain it. But the idea is you overexpress a certain um, oncogene or, or tumor suppressor in, in these cells. You image them, extract their features, and then cluster them. So this is a correlation matrix where um, if it's along the diagonal, it just tells you that uh, each allele looks like itself. And so the question is, what else does it look like? So you see these, um, these three uh, grouped at the top look like each other, the three at the bottom look like each other, the other guys in the middle look like each other. And um, what this tells us is that, for example, for the gene BRAF, we have the wild type version of BRAF is towards the bottom here. Um, it doesn't really have a phenotype in the cell painting assay. So you overexpress BRAF, it looks kind of like empty, which is our, our negative control. Nothing really changes about the cells. However, when you have these constitutively active forms of BRAF, um, 
um, like the middle blob, which includes V600E, the cells change in some way. And then if you have a different set of, of mutations that behave in a different way, you get a, a, different, a different morphology phenotype. So we can do this uh, across lots of different genes. Um, and again, just a fraction are shown here. There's a whole um, database where you can look up um, the different genes that we tested in the experiment and see um, what in, in what circumstances do different variants look like each other. And this, um, is a really uh, useful strategy in general for looking at large sets of, of human variants where we don't know the significance. We don't know whether it's a driving mutation of the cancer or not, um, with, and, and this gives you at least a, a, a hypothesis for groups of, of alleles based on their similarities to each other. Any questions about, about that part? All right, so one really cool thing about having a, a, a profile for a gene that you care about or a profile for a disease that you care about is that you can take that as a query and go test, are there any compounds that have either the same profile or maybe the opposite profile of, of the, the query that, I've, um, that I'm interested in? So we've already seen a, teen, a teensy example of this in the um, schizophrenia, um, the psychosis experiment where we found this mitochondrial dispersion. We could go computationally just look up, have we ever seen drugs that impact mitochondrial dispersion? But that was just one that was just one feature. Here we're looking, does the entire profile match um, to, for, for more complex phenotypes? And uh, it turns out this works, um, this works reasonably well some fraction of the time. And so again, the input here is some gene that you care about that you wanna know, you wanna go find a chemical regulator for. So put the gene in, you see if it has a, has a um, uh, morphological signature. Roughly half the time it won't, and then you're done. There's nothing you can do. But half the time it does have a, a, a cell painting phenotype, and then you can go and search, have I ever seen that among all the compounds that are in this experiment? So we had around 30,000 compounds. Roughly half of those had a phenotype that we could use for matching. And what we found is, um, first with some control genes, we, we took a bunch of known gene compound pairs where a particular gene was known um, to yield a cell painting phenotype, and then it was also known that there were certain compounds that, that target that gene, that gene's product, I should say. And in this case, we found out of the controls, roughly 32% of the genes had the correct compounds at the top of the rank ordered list of matches. So we're pretty excited about that. Of course, we wish it was 100%, but um, if you can use this virtual query, you can save a pharma company screening, let's say, a million compounds, and that adds up to a lot of money. So um, long story short, we predicted compounds that would um, be regulators of seven different genes, and we provided those lists to seven different laboratories that were studying the seven different genes, and um, five of them gave pretty, like pretty okay results in the initial round, but then sort of fell apart with the chemistry. The, the, chemi the um, compounds had degraded to some degree and weren't really worth pursuing. But in three cases, we found compounds that certifiably did what we had hoped they would do, regulate some, the, some pathway of interest. Um, in particular, the one we were most excited about is YAP1, where we found three really good pathway regulators, and then um, we made some analogs that were um, chemically similar to the original ones, and in the end, um, here we're trying to kill sarcoma so cells, so lower is better. These are um, sarcoma cells that are dependent on YAP for growth, and the original hits are shown in blue, um, and so they worked pretty well, and then we found some variants that are even working better, um, and these are some that we're hoping to partner with the National Cancer Institute to push further down along the pipeline. So again, the fundamental idea here is, Tell me the gene you care about, and I will give you a list of compounds that might impact that gene. And um, that's an offer that I'm willing to make to everybody. Um, we, we, we only had 60-some genes in this original experiment, so if your gene isn't on that list, it's, um, it's bad luck. But, um, but the, as I said, the 13,000 genes that we are currently producing will have lists available for those um, starting in November. So you can just look up and order the compounds and see if you can find some that have some activity that you might be interested in. Any questions about this um, gene compound matching and virtual screening? All right. Um, next example I'll give is, oh, can somebody tell me the time? Because I don't have my... 30 seconds. Okay. Um, can we assess the mechanism of potential drugs based on their profiles? So a lot of times a pharma company will identify a compound that has 
a positive behavior in a particular disease-based assay, but they don't know exactly how it works. And it's not necessary to know how a drug works in order to get it approved, but it sure is helpful because there's a lot of steps where it would be really nice to know what protein is it binding, what is it doing, or what proteins is it binding, because it's often more than one. Um, so we can use images to uh, address this question by taking a query compound and, again, saying, Here's this compound, we don't know what it's doing or how it's working. We know it's potentially useful for disease X, but um, how does it work? Let's see if it matches anything that we've ever um, tested in our database. And um, here, it's a relatively well proven that you can do this for um, compound, compound, compound matching. So if you have a compound of interest and it matches the profile of another compound, they probably have the same mechanism of action. So mechanism of action is abbreviated MOA here. And um, we did a, a dose response. And um, as you can see, as you go up in dose, you end up finding more and more of these mechanism of action classes of compounds do produce these similar image-based profiles. And what's interesting here is that we had two types of profiles to compare with each other. We had transcriptional profiles, and then we had the image-based cell painting profiles. And if I asked anybody to say, it, you, you only get one type of data, would you rather have transcriptional profiles or would you rather have images of the samples in order to quantitatively see which ones, uh, you know, what the mechanism of your compound is? I think most of us would have said the mRNA should be more information rich. Um, it's kind of an inherently quantitative data type. Um, so we were, we were really pleased when we saw that um, the images um, hold their own against the much more expensive L1000 assay. I should say L1000 is a very high throughput transcriptional based assay, so it's not the same as doing a full out gene chip or RNA-seq or anything like that. Um, but still, here cell painting is not only um, more powerful, it's also cheaper um, to be able to carry out this kind of work. And this gives you a sense of um, which of those classes are better predicted in one data type versus the other so that you can try to discern some patterns. We couldn't really discern some pat patterns here, but it's also because we don't know a lot about the different classes themselves. But you can see many, many you would, you would find um, the correct answer for that compound using either method, um, but again, the image-based data is, is just less expensive. All right, and I think the last example I have is predicting the outcome of assays uh, using, by correlating the readout to cell painting profiles. So let's say you're a pharma company, you've got a um, couple million compounds in your screening library, and you test them once by cell painting. You produce images for every single compound, so you know every single compound impacts the cell painting profi the profiles in a certain way. And then um, you now go about your business. You've got all kinds of other assays that you routinely run. And the question is, is the data in those cell painting images sufficient to predict the outcomes in all the other assays that you might want to run? If it can, then you can predict all of those other assays' um, outcomes without physically doing the experiment. You can just um, look up the data, make predictions, and then run a few thousand compounds rather than a few million compounds through the individual assays. So how does this work? Um, to understand this, it, it does help to understand, first of all, what I think is something of a miracle. It's already the case that if you have chemical structures that have been trained through a, a neural network, you can train the network to take in a structure and predict whether that chemical structure is um, likely to be a hit in each of these different assays. So this is already something that works to some degree. It's, it's not fantastic. It's on the order of like 10% of assays or so can be predicted um, using this basic strategy. Um, that is already very cool. Um, it does require that you have enough examples to train the network on, and those examples have to have enough chemical similarity to the ones that you're predicting in, in order to do a good job of that. So we thought, you know, it's amazing that this works at all, but it's kind of unfair, because you're not telling the system anything biological, you're just saying, here's the structure. Is it likely to be a good, a good regulator of this protein or a good activator of, of something? Um, so let's give it a little bit more information and, and, um, and hopefully improve the accuracy. Let's give the system not just the chemical structures, but also images from the cell painting assay and then these mRNA profiles, the L1000 um, high throughput assay. And does that biological information together with the structures, does that help us predict the outcomes of assays more, more readily? 
And the results are shown here. Um, as you can see, uh, again, the, the images are um, the most information rich uh, data modality. There's, um, in this case, no assays were well predicted by, by all three of them. Each of them has their strengths and they're, they're very complementary to each other. And we did all kinds of different analyses of different combinations of them. So I'll, I'll spare you the details, um, the um, papers in bioarchive about this. But um, basic idea is that if you just do, just have the image-based data alone, you can predict 28 assays out of the total, which I'm sorry, I think here is 270 total. Um, so roughly 10% of them are predictable by um, morphology and then single digits for the others. But then if you combine um, data from all three types, you can push it up to roughly 15% of assays. Again, 15% is not 100%, but each of those assays that can be predicted means that a pharma company doesn't have to spend a few million dollars screening um, their whole deck. They can just predict the outcome and then test the compounds directly. Any questions about this one? This one's a little more machine learning intensive. All right, so um, those are all the applications that I wanted to talk about. Um, just wanted to close by saying that there's a lot of um, new data that is coming into this field, and I'm glad there was a question and, and appetite for this data, because um, this consortium that we've formed with a bunch of pharma companies is producing this beautiful public data that'll be released this November, and it includes the 13,000 overexpressed genes that we made here at the, Bro at the Broad, uh, 8,000 CRISPR knockdowns, which will be made at, at Casilink between now and November, and then um, 100,000 um, small molecules that are made uh, at all the different companies. So it'll be a really rich resource. Um, this is the, the one place, even though, as I've said, image-based profiling is a really powerful and information-rich data source, um, it's really stymied until we have public data bases like, like already exists for mRNA. Um, so that, that project is underway and, and is, coming, is coming to a close with the release of that data soon. So all kinds of other things you can do with image-based data. I just showed a, a sampling of them today, but um, there are um, uh, review articles to describe them more thoroughly if you're interested. There's different conferences that focus on this data type and what you can do with it. Um, again, you can get the slides at, at this link here. And with that, I'm happy to answer any further questions. Oh, great. Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that. So the question is how the feature library is generated. And for almost every project I described today, um, we were literally using Cell Profiler um, to identify where the nucleus and the cell borders are and then extract every feature that it knows how to measure. Like just put all the measurement modules in there and measure absolutely everything about every channel, every compartment. Um, so pretty straightforward classical image processing. Um, it is the case that you can instead say, here is the raw pixels of the image. Let's use deep learning to extract features directly from the pixels instead of a, a classical image-based um, or a classical image processing. And um, and that method in multiple papers in the field has been shown to be at least equivalent to, to cell profiler features. It's it's typically um, more convenient in the sense that. Um, you, the processing time is, is lower usually for using a deep learning feature extractor. Um, some, in some comparisons, it starts to be a bit better than cell profiler as well, or I shouldn't say cell profiler specifically, it's just classical image processing. So I, I would say right now it seems like people have pushed it to maybe, tw deep learning is maybe 20% better ex at extracting features. The one downside though is you get out these mushy deep learning features and you don't know what they mean. So, um, so we've often preferred to, at least for the first run of a given application, we prefer to use classical features because we, we can interpret what they mean, we understand what channel it's related to and the different compartment that it's related to and so on. So it, it gives us a little more biological insight. Um, but for some methods like the assay prediction, um, we don't care how it's predicting the outcome, we really just want the assays to be predicted as accurately as possible. And in that case, um, you, you, know, you may as well use the, the deep learning features. Um, no, that was a really wonderful talk. I'm wondering if you have considered kind of combining the two major technologies you talked about, which was kind of the morphological profiling with kind of the cell imaging or like the deeper cell imaging with various dyes so that you could kind of explore things like co-culture and how different cell types interact with one another. 
Yeah, so for sure. Um, the, we've done a few experiments with co-culture, and, um, and it's often the case that you can distinguish two cell types just based on their morphology alone, like you don't even need a biomarker or an antibody or something to recognize each one. Uh, but regardless, whatever way you do it, if you can recognize two different cell types in your samples, um, then absolutely you can measure, you can extract features from both of them kind of independently and then compare and contrast how does each perturbation impact the two different cell types and how does it impact how they, how they spatially relate to each other and the connections that they have if those are labeled and so on, for, for sure. So, quick question. Uh, just kind of curious to the culture of the companies. You know, for a lot of companies, it's kind of a, particularly drugs, drug companies, kind of a foreign concept doing this kind of thing. Have you, what kind of challenge have you had in terms of collaboration and getting them to adopt this technology? Oh, I, I love that question. So, um, so my lab's been around for 15 years, and when I gave my job talk at the Broad 16 years ago and said, "Here's, I want to start my lab. Um, I want to help biologists get information out of images in the kind of classical, like, tell me the phenotype you care about. We'll figure out how to measure it. I want to do that. But also, my futuristic slide was, it'd be really cool if we could extract features and do this kind of matching and all this, all this stuff. So basically, everything that we're doing today was, was in that job talk 16 years ago. And it's, it was pulling teeth for many, many, um, many years, um, just saying like, look, this is all this cool stuff you can do. And um, I, I can't even say what turned the corner. I think just gradually people getting used to, I, I think we all just, you know, myself included, we all just had this sort of bias that it's not really a molecular data type, right? It's not a very quantitative data type. They're mushy, pretty images, but is there really like really that much information there? Or, or is it just like in broad strokes, like, oh yeah, those cells are bigger, those cells are greener, you know, is it just gonna be really broad and, um, and not that specific? So um, I think it was partly just people getting used to the idea that, that images are information. And um, to some degree, um, Somebody just had to start taking a leap in there. So Recursion being the example of the a startup company was just a couple of graduate students that were really enthused about like, hey, we, if we mutate the, or we knock out this gene associated with disease, we see a phenotype, let's, let's start a drug company. So they did and it's, it's been um, remarkably successful. Um, so I, I think it just took folks going a little out on a limb in that respect for big pharma to, to um, adopt the technology. I've been told that, um, that it's really hard to kind of um, really hard to, to get the, the community to adopt a new technology unless they see other peop, other companies doing it. So, um, so they'll see papers coming out of academia and they'll be like, oh, that's, that's cool, that's interesting, like maybe that'll be something someday. But if, if you can get one other pharma company to try something and really do it and internalize it and, um, and publish it, then suddenly everybody's really interested. And that's, that's what happened. There was a paper in 20, only 2018, just a few years ago, um, by Janssen that really got people's attention. And then suddenly, not to say my phone was ringing off the hook, but there was a real inflection point where all the other companies started to be interested once they saw that, that paper come out. All right, well, Anne will be here for a few minutes if you have any other questions, and thank you so much, Anne. Thank you very much. Recording stopped.